Hello everybody, this is CJ Wiley with more Adventures on the Road. As I put this book together, it's becoming clear to me that uh, everything happens for a reason. And if you've noticed in your own life, a lot of times the right person at the right time, at the right place, at the right situation will show up and literally change your life and outcomes that uh, that you bring forth. It's amazing how that happens. So well orchestrated, it seems like. <clears throat> so, one of my major influencers was also one of my best friends in high school, and his name was John Emmerich. And just meeting him was a real fluke. <laughs> Or miracle, whichever way you want to look at it. Again, it appears like there's divine intervention when I start to think about these stories in more detail. See, I played tennis and golf uh, with the equal amount of talent and passion when I was in my early teenage years. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I was 12, I went around with a man named Terry Taylor, who ended up being the college tennis coach at Northeast Missouri State University, and we went around his 49 Plymouth and gave tennis lessons. I was his protege, or his assistant, and uh, I loved tennis, and I played it mostly in the summer, and then I played pool in the winter, <laughs> so um, it was a perfect combination because I lived in northern Missouri, Green City, Missouri, and it was really cold in the winter, so it was about six months of really nice weather. There was tennis weather, and then another six months it was, it was better suited for indoor games like pool, it seemed like, and I loved to play pool. But tennis was difficult for me to play because my town didn't have a tennis court. So I used to hit balls against the wall and uh, there was a place up at our school that had, uh, one place had some pavement, but, but where I hit most of my balls was on these, uh, had thin rocks. So when the ball bounced, it would be erratic. And that really helped my hand-eye coordination and, and uh, reflexes so that uh, it carried over into my regular game. And then my father ended up making me a dirt tennis court. He had a lumber yard, so he made a, a dirt tennis court, and I used to spend hours and hours and hours hitting off a Prince ball machine. That's one of those machines that throws out the balls, thump, thump, and I would literally play six to eight hours a day by myself. So Kirksville, Missouri was really the closest place where I could find a tennis court. So one day my mother took me over to uh, the high school tennis courts and I had three orange tennis balls, like rock hard. I'd hit them so much I'd knocked all the fuzz off of them. And I didn't have anybody to play with so I was hitting tennis balls by myself as my mother sat up in the stands and, and read a book. And on the other side of the fence, uh, the high school kids were playing and that seemed, uh, I mean, I, I really wished I could have played with them, and, and I remember, you know, the feeling of, of uh, loneliness, really, because I didn't have anybody to play with. Well, one of the young men finished his match and came over and stood, you know, by where my mother was sitting and just watched me with, uh, I think curiosity and, and really just confusion, like how could this kid just hit three orange tennis balls, you know, I served them, I was practicing my serve, so I hit three tennis balls, went and gathered them up, hit, hit them back over the net, gathered them up, I mean, that shows kind of how compulsive I was to get great at sports, and, and ones that had balls were my uh, forte. I always say I can play with any ball that you can't put your fingers in, because I never really was in bowling, and uh, even though, you know, <laughs> uh, 
I just never had the passion for it. But um, so after watching me, this, uh, you know, he was 17 years old, I believe. I was 14 or 16. He was 16. So he came over and he said, would you like to hit some balls with me? And I lit up <laughs> like a bright light and said, yeah, sure. And I was so thrilled and, and uh, come to find out this young man was named John Emmerich and uh, he ended up being second in the state of Missouri for high school tennis. And we exchanged numbers after we hit, and uh, it became a way for me to actually play the game. My mother would take me to Kirksville, Missouri, where he lived, which was about 20 miles away from Green City, and leave me for the weekend, and I would play tennis as much as I could <clears throat> and stay with John at his house. And uh, I don't think his mother really liked me that much, and... Uh, I'd have to sneak in the window sometime, which was kind of, sometimes, which was kind of funny. So I would, uh, I'd sneak in, stay the night, and then I would go out of his bedroom window, go around the house, ring the doorbell, and uh, his mother would answer, and I'd say, is John here? <laughs> oh, he's in his room. I'll go get him. And she'd always kind of look to see, you know, where my mother was, because she thought, you know, apparently... My mother had dropped me off at the house. <laughs> I would say, oh, she had something to do. She she uh, was in a hurry. But that was not quite the truth, but that's how we did it. And uh, we became really good friends and went through a lot together. And uh, without John, a lot of things in my life could not have happened. So I've told the story of when I first went to Columbia, Missouri to uh, play pool at the Columbia Billiard Center. It was after I met Tom Draper at uh, Leisure World, this bowling alley, and I went to John and asked him if I could borrow his car. Now, I was 15 years old, and he had a, uh, what was it, a yellow Mazda car, and he agreed to let me drive it to Columbia, Missouri. The stipulation was, you wreck you pay. <laughs> I'll always remember that. And, uh, cause I had quite a bit of money cause I had a, my own snow cone business. And probably at that time I had probably 17 or 18,000 in the bank, which was a lot of money back then. Cause when I was 16, I bought a, a new car, uh, that was 18,000. I can't even remember trying to talk them down. I hope they didn't call, uh, charge me retail. <laughs> my mother was with me, but I didn't get any pointers about, uh, maybe she had it prearranged. So I wreck, I pay. So I went to Columbia, Missouri, and that was opened up a chapter of my life that I've talked about where I played with Craig Bickford and Keith was the first one that I played uh, gambling for 20 a game. But I ended up going back to Columbia many times and, and borrowed John's car to do it, which was really nice of him and uh, never had any issues. I never got pulled over and never had any accidents. So I got that uh, opportunity because of John. So now John graduates. We ended up taking a trip together. And uh, the first time I ever played pool outside of Missouri was in Elkhart, Indiana. And John and I were on a trip over to the East Coast, and we stopped in this little pool room in Elkhart, Indiana. It was right on the square, and it was just an old-time pool room. I went in there, and again, I'm 16 years old at this time, and asked if anybody wanted to gamble playing pool. Well, they had somebody come down, and I played them for 20 a game and beat them out of, uh, I think, $120, which was such a big accomplishment for me because, man, I was playing out of my home state. That was a, that was kind of a big deal, and I could, you know, prove that I could go to another state to a strange pool room and make money playing the game that I loved. So that's really why I started pursuing pool more than tennis. Tennis, you almost have to be pretty well off. It's like golf, you know. Most of the tennis players and golf players. Uh, 
you know, have to come from a pretty wealthy family, which I didn't. My uh, mother and father together made about 14000 a year back uh, when I was selling snow cones because I made more than both of them put together one year. And I remember that. I made like seventeen or 18000 in one year. And uh, that was more than both parents put together. Now, that wasn't all profit, but that's what we we generated. So, John, uh, so we took the trip over and, and visited my sister in Boston, Massachusetts, and he went on down to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, because he went to Georgia Tech, and he was an engineer, and I didn't bring up the fact that he was the valedictorian of his senior class and never took a book home. He is, to this day, certainly probably top three most intelligent people I've ever been around, and I've been around a lot of them, you know, that have different skill sets, but John was, uh, not only was he book smart, but he had a lot of common sense as well, which sometimes isn't mixed in there, <laughs> because he told me when he was, uh, when he was 18, that there was not a mathematical problem that he couldn't solve, and if it couldn't be solved, he could tell you in less than five minutes to prove he wasn't a servant. So that's the level. Uh, with three days study, he said he could get an A in any test, any subject, in any college, and he proved that to be true, which is another story I won't get into, <laughs> but uh, he was... Uh, definitely mathematically inclined and I am too just in a different way like he said he couldn't figure numbers as fast in his head as I could but you know I never had the uh, the level of mathematics that he had and he is exceptional one of the best mathematicians in the country I would I would think <clears throat> and he uh he proved that. I, I could go into all kinds of stories that are almost unbelievable about things that he's done and ended up uh, now lives in Hawaii and uh, got into an internet business and, and did really well. He can definitely afford uh, a few jets. <laughs> you know, if he wanted to be a jet setter, he could definitely afford several jets. He owns a hotel in Hawaii and a really nice house. And very modest, you know, he probably wouldn't say these things himself, but uh, I, it's just facts, you know, and that's what this is about. And um, so he went to Georgia Tech, and after the, the, uh, the road trip that I took with Omaha John, where I've told about that changing experience in that bar in Bishopsville, South Carolina, where I looked myself in the mirror and, and really made a change uh, that carried forth from that point on. But in getting to that level at pool at, at that age, it took a toll on me. So I would have to take breaks. And after we won that money, uh, Omaha John went back to Omaha. And I went to Atlanta to visit John, stay with him, and and didn't play pool for about a month. And then when I came out and started playing again, I lost 1700 to uh, a guy named uh, Randall. What was his name? Randall Rhodes. Anyway, I've misplaced that name, but I'll, uh, I've told that story too. I lost 1700 and then ended up being just a, uh, we call it a lemon or a seed where you plant a seed and it grows into something bigger because I stayed in Atlanta and won about 20000 after that because they thought I was a sucker. So that's my experience in life. Some of the greatest things that's happened to me is after defeats, not after victories. I mean, it's great to win, but I actually, looking back, cherish my losses because I can see how they were essential to reach the levels that I did, you know. There's no easy path to being a champion at anything. So John uh, ended up graduating from Georgia Tech and, and moved to Texas. And 
and uh, he was in Denton, Texas. So that's the first apartment that I actually got with him that was in Denton, Texas. So I paid him half of the rent. And uh, it was funny because when we made the deal, I gave him half the rent and then I went on the road and didn't come back for about three months. So I actually sent him half the rent every uh, month. So what, what a great deal for him. And, uh, but I had a home base, you know. I, I've been a nomad most of my life and, and, and I don't mind it, but it's always nice to have a home base. So John and I spent a lot of time there and he got me into something called neuro-linguistic programming. He was studying it and uh, I was curious about it. I mean, I have a very curious nature, you know, that's one thing that, that I'm glad that I have because uh, it keeps me always looking to learn new things. And so I've taken on a plethora of subject and studied them <laughs> till, you know, till the bitter end, you know, I mean, uh, I've probably got 12,000 hours into studying various things. And that includes martial arts. I've taken over 1,700 martial arts lessons and given several as well because I was a, a second-degree black belt instructor for 24 years in uh, Dallas. And John was uh, my roommate. We ended up buying a house together. And that was in uh, Carrollton, Texas. And then he ended up... Uh, going to Hawaii, I kept the house, ended up selling the house, and so uh, that's where his major accomplishments happened, but he got me into the neuro-linguistic programming, and that changed my life in a positive way. It's the study of how words are used to program the mind, and it's basically like an all-star program put together from various effective uh, models of behavior and it's a metal model of the English language and like I said how words are used to program the mind very useful to know these days because there's a lot of programming especially the TV programming <laughs> it's all hidden in plain sight they broadcast they read from uh, their scripts See, there's something that I learned in NLP that, that helped me a lot. And it's the ability to, uh, to read eye access patterns and calibrate nonverbal communication. We all have the ability to do that. And really, the communication you get subconsciously from someone is even more powerful than the words they say. So uh, I think nonverbal communication is, is over 80% of the communication we get from each other. The tonality is about 13%. And I think the words themselves are only like 7 or 8% according to the research that I've done. Uh, so it's not what you say, it's how you say what you say that's important. And these eye access patterns are interesting because you can't read anyone's mind, but you can read how they're thinking, like the process that they're using. Is it visual? Is it auditory? Is it kinesthetic, which is feel and taste? Everybody experiences the world on a specific channel, usually. Like there's visual people. I'm really visual. I think a lot of... Uh, pool players are, are really visual and uh, you know you can tell auditory people they'll tell you stories and say well he said this and she said this and, and I heard what he said and see it's hard for me to, uh, to listen to that very long because I don't process the world through everything somebody says I'm doing it in a different way and a lot of it is has been trained in I've learned how to, uh, let me give you an example. 
like if you're stuck on something and you can't figure it out at all and you want to get clear, there's a process that your mind goes through. You start out stuck, then you're confused, then you're missing something, then you're curious, then you're clear. So however you do it, you have to go through that process to go from stuck to clear. So what we did was use a technique to train ourselves, our mind, to go from that stuck to clear faster and more effectively. And what the outcome is, as I said earlier, I'm naturally curious, but the best way to really to process life is in that curiosity mode. You don't want to be in the mode of confusion, even though I know several people that live like that, and you probably do too. You don't want to be in a state of missing something. I know people like that. It seems like they're always missing something, and they're blaming things on other people, and it's, if I just had this, or if I just had that, that's not a good way to live. So the curiosity state, become as a child, Children are naturally curious, and I think that curiosity is dampened by the educational system. That's another story, but they take away a lot of the natural curiosity that people have and just tell you everything is like this and this and this and this and this. So you're not encouraged to do your own thinking, and as a result, common sense is... Uh, almost eliminated in some cases, you know. I think the more educated someone gets, really, the less common sense they have access to. Not all people, so if you're highly educated, I'm not saying, you know, you don't have any common sense, but uh, I think you know the point. I don't judge people, you know, uh, that's just... I do notice, though, <laughs> things like the eye access patterns. When somebody's looking up, you can tell... When people look up, they're processing the visual part of their mind. They're, they're either remembering or constructing visual pictures. When they're in the center, they're processing sounds and what people say. And, and again, one, one side will tell you that they're uh, remembering it. The other side, they're constructing it. That doesn't mean if somebody is constructing something and telling you that they're lying but it gives you a hint. I don't really think about this stuff anymore unless I think someone's lying to me. Then I shift into that gear and I'm watching their eye access patterns and see how they match. Are they congruent to what they're saying? I mean, if they're, if they're visualizing these pictures and then telling me about the sounds that they're hearing, then that's a incongruent thing and doesn't mean anything for sure. But it's just more information. And the more knowledge and information you have about something, the more powerful you can become as a person. You know, it's the law of requisite variety. The person with the most flexibility will have the most control. And you develop flexibility through being well rounded and understanding a variety of topics as well as you can. And uh, just like in pool. You want to be able to use all kinds of different English to do different things with the cue ball. But at the higher levels, you really want to focus on eliminating those variables. You know, they say the beginner has many choices and the master has few. And it's because less choices is actually better once you get the system and the techniques down. <laughs> That's a process, but uh, like when I play my best pool, I cue the ball slightly to the inside on every shot I can. I hit everything with the same tempo that I can. I line up uh, from the same starting point, either center to center or center to edge on the object ball every time. You know, so, so you know, if, if the categories are there, it's like same, 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 same. So that is what consistency is at the, uh, at the root, is doing the same thing over and over and perfecting that technique. That's what I do to help people with their pool games. I show them a foundation that 
allows them to start in the same place every time, just like a champion player. The champions do it naturally. I did too. It took me thousands of hours to figure out what I did at the unconscious level, but, but that neurolinguistic programming helped me do it because part of it is a modeling uh, education. Because they say if it's possible in the world, it's possible for you or me. Now, that doesn't mean we can be an NBA basketball player if we're, uh, you know, not very tall and not very coordinated. But their point was really mentally, you know, if it's possible for someone, it's possible for you, but you have to know their techniques. And uh, there's a wide range of uh, examples I could give. I have a degree in Erikssonian hypnosis. And uh, Milton Erickson is the one that, that uh, was behind that study and one of the greatest hypnotherapists that ever lived. But he was in a wheelchair all his life, had seven or eight brothers and sisters. So he learned this amazing skill set of being able to change behaviors subconsciously by just talking about them. So learning how to solve those problems faster, the stuck to clear. Remember, it's stuck, confused, missing something, curious, and clear. And there's some advanced things you can do with people, you know, and there again, it can be used for hustling and it can be used for good. And that is to identify where somebody is, either in life or on a topic, you know, are they confused? <laughs> are they confused about a lot of stuff? Then, if you want to help them, you can bring them into what are they missing, then into curiosity of what that is, and then to solve their own problem. You just help them with that, with that process. So, I've done that a lot, and uh, I've also used it a few times for uh, people that I didn't get along with very well. And uh, I try to be, you know, less like that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I've almost eliminated it out of my life, you know. I just want to help people. And because of my hustling and gambling background, I can see the advanced hustles that are very sophisticated because they involve billions and trillions of dollars. But all of them are basically the same at the root just like you learn in the pool rooms. That's why I say it's good to have a PhD, a pool hall degree. So I'm going to talk more and more specifically about uh, some of the things John Emmerich and I did and how it influenced my life because we did a process in Hawaii called Jump Rock where we jumped off this mystical rock at a hidden place in Hawaii <laughs> and uh, you know the folklore is that whatever you ask for you'll get and that's where we develop the goal setting process that I used to win the ESPN World Championships and become the most televised player at that time on ESPN and uh, I ended up getting to the finals of the ESPN uh, championships three years in a row. So I won it in 96, I was second in 97, and runner-up in 98. So uh, that was a lot of TV exposure and changed my life. And I'm going to tell you some of the, the secrets of how I created that reality. And the input I got from John Emmerich in taking uh, classes in Hawaii called the, uh, the Huna Training with Tad James about the original Kahuna Indians in Hawaii. And uh, a lot of things I think you'll find interesting. As I get more into this book, I can see my life laid out in front of me. And... Uh, it's amazing. Like I said, the right people at the right time and the right places and the right situations will show up. I think it's divine intervention. What do you think? 
If you want to know more about my fundamental systems and techniques I use to become one of the best players in the world, join me at MasteringPocketBillards.com, and I'll show you uh, how to play like the pros play. Until next time, this is CJ, over and out.